Good morning, friends. It's Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cooks United Methodist Church. Welcome. Uh, I hope the start of a new week uh, has been glorious for you, as chilly as it is uh, outside. May the warmth of God's Spirit be on you and within you. Good morning, Gail. I see a bunch of you have popped on too, and I didn't see your names. Hey, Gwen. So, it's so good to see um, everybody. Um, wow, what a, a big week we've got ahead of us. Don't know why it catches me. Hey, Cecily. Um, it does, I don't know why it catches us off guard every year. Um, most often, uh, we find ourselves heading from Thanksgiving, which is usually busy with our family, um, straight into Advent, which is a busy time for a lot of churches. Hey, Linda, it's good to see you. And I saw Janet pop on. Uh, good morning to everybody. But it's a busy, busy time. All the more important, my friends, for us to make time to kind of settle our spirits and make sure that our focus is on God and think about uh, those who are outside of our immediate circle and for me, that means this week remembering those who have never, who don't have a good experience around the table or they don't have a table to gather around, they don't have family to gather with, um, they're estranged, um, alone, um, for us to remember that everybody else's experience is not like ours. So we're praying for you. And we're praying for those folks. Uh, remember, uh, prayer is an exchange of what we long to see happen. Um, and then it, to leave that with God, but also to be willing to take on and to take within what it is that God has for us. It just could be that part of our Thanksgiving celebration is not just with our own family and trying to figure out how you go, you know, 411 million places to eat turkey and dressing and all that stuff at every one of them. Maybe it would include sharing a meal with somebody else who doesn't have anybody or doesn't have the meal. Just a thought for us to be mindful of remembering the rest of the world is not experiencing it just like we are. Um, especially let me uh, lift two sweet friends uh, to you. I know each one of us is carrying a big load, um, but I'm uh, also praying for peace and comfort for Angel right now. Um, it's been a long journey for her brother, uh, and he has gone on to be with the Lord uh, this weekend. And so please pray for all of his family, especially our friend Angel. And I also want to lift up um, our brother Dan. To the glory of God, you are Dan. Dan um, unexpectedly uh, passed from this life to the next over the weekend, and it's been especially hard um, for um, Sunday school class and a couple of areas here in the church that he uh, worked in. And so those who are sad this morning, we're praying that God would lift up. And we do know that, um, anyway, his, his family needs our prayers, his neighbors, his circle of friends, uh, that we would all know peace. Um, I will celebrate this, though. There's not a soul that I know that also knows our brother Dan who has not said in the last 72 hours what a genuinely kind and sweet man. What a testimony. So thank you for um, keeping those folks in your prayers too. Uh, and we would love to pray with you and to pray over you. So if there's anything uh, that, that we can be praying about, you just type that in or let the church office know however we can. And we want to be able to walk alongside you. We got a lot of ground to cover um, because it seems like when the days are getting short here, we, yeah, we've just got a lot to do. But um, 
this is important and so we're going to go a little slow today the readings from uh, that i want to focus on today are actually still from last week um, but they um, our book ended this one particular day um, was book ended by this notion of praying what and so let me just say do we you know that prayer and uh, I'll pray for you pray for me I, all of those things that we throw around those words we throw around in the church and just assume that everybody knows or is growing in their understanding of prayer growing in their practice of prayer those are really dangerous assumptions for us to make and so I want to reiterate again that when you find the word prayer in the New Testament, especially in the Greek language, uh, I'm re making references to the kind of the core um, pieces of communication all come from the Greek language uh, when it's New Testament, Hebrew when it's Old Testament. Both the Hebrew and the Greek have the same understanding, but it's easier to talk about from the Greek. And so when I tell you that in the Greek language, prayer is meant as we pray to God is meant as an exchange. I come with all that I have uh, and all that I'm willing to give up right there at the feet of grace. But that leaves me trusting that God has heard and that God has something for me. Sometimes our laments really are about dumping, venting, all of those things that we feel, and we're not quite ready then to take on. But it's my suspicion that many of us turn um, those prayers that are not really laments, they're just whining. And we never receive, we, ne we never intentionally open ourselves for what God could have for us and James um, written about this same time um, uh, as Acts <clears throat> because of the level of persecution that was beginning to happen James includes in his uh, manuscript there this uh, business of praying for one another and praying over one another so very quickly, I want to walk us through a couple of things that lead to James chapter 5, and then we're going to swap back to Acts uh, because um, there is something about prayer there for us too. So James, uh, we, we stopped last week with um, the notion of humility being that position of strength. When we release everything, we expect, we want... Uh, we want to insist on that when we let go of our own significance, when we let go of being right, when we submit ourselves to God, then God raises us up. Um, but it's a different kind of power. It's a greater peace. Um, that was in response to some things that, James was hearing about these uh, folks who were considered to be the church. There were quarrels among them. They were fighting about silly things. Sound familiar? Um, they were also uh, responding with a great unkindness um, to one another. And so he even, he even called them out for the way they were talking about each other. And just said, you, you, you know, this business of faith, you can act like you know everything. You can act like you've got power to do anything. But if it doesn't begin with humility and submission, because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So you can talk big about what you've planning for your life, what you're planning for the church's life, what you're... But I, he, do you know this Chinese proverb, man plans or humanity plans and God laughs. God's ideas are always wiser. That's the importance, y'all, the, the critical nature of, of a, a righteous prayer really is that notion of exchange. Say what you need to to God. He is big enough. He can take it. 
but the other part of prayer is also be opening uh, open so that you can receive what God has for you. It might be encouragement. It might be a job. It might be um, some cleanup work that needs to be done. Uh, it might be a learning, uh, a discovery. Um, there are all kinds, of, and sometimes all at once. So J uh, James is trying to help people understand when you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, when you know that what you are doing is wrong and you do it anyway, that's the other side of the same coin. That's sin. Don't be afraid of that word sin. Understand it, the power of its truth. But what we mean is, what James meant is we've missed the mark. You're aiming for one thing. Well, you didn't hit it. There are a lot of reasons why we don't get to the mark we've set ourselves toward. James is referencing here, we know what the next step needs to be, and we're either procrastinating, or we're lazy, or we're hesitant. And it's usually because of what we think it's going to cost us. James says this, be patient. Be patient in your suffering. Be patient with one another. Be patient. That word patience there um, uh, shows up a lot during this time of persecution. A matter of fact, it feels like it's in every chapter of the book of Revelation. And so, uh, as John records that, you, you can see that patience and um, this other word that we have, long-suffering, um, for that uh, really seems um, a little uh, petite for this tall order. Uh, be patient. Uh, Macrothumeo means to suffer long, to be will. That's a willingness, y'all, uh, to suffer long or to be forbearing. Think of it. It really is the opposite of being quick-tempered. Being uh, long in patience, not just with God or for God, but with one another. Uh, this response to suffering, we sometimes translate or think suffering is a very personal thing. And it, and it is, um, uh, especially when you begin to undergird that with the reasons. Here, James's encouragement is for those who are experiencing trouble especially because of their faith in Jesus. And so when he says, are you in trouble? Uh, then, uh, and the suffering there, when, when you're in trouble, tr another word for that is suffering. And when um, uh, the best metaphor to talk about that, the kind of suffering or the trouble that's meant here when the call for perseverance or patience is given, is a military kind of uh, service. Uh, when you go to the military, you it is a life or death situation. And not just for yourself, you are fighting for someone else. That's why it's so important, I think, for us to hold on to that uh, analogy, that metaphor, because when you and I pray for one another, we are doing battle for one another. We, we have gone beyond our limited power and are calling on unlimited power for the resolution of those things that are not about peace. So we have to hear James's encouragement. And, and I, I'm going to skip. I, there's an admonition here. If you're in trouble, do this. And when you're happy, do this. When you're sick, do this. Listen to this, though. Confess your sins to each other. And pray, I'm going to add this word, believing. Pray believing that what you're asking for is God's will. It is possible, even probable, and I am open for whenever you want to deliver that. Sorry for the phone. And so here, here we've got um, 
an admonition from James to pray believing. This is about inviting yourself, one whom you are praying over, and the source of everything, the one to whom we pray, to envelop uh, all three into a, a beautiful relationship, one that is effective and powerful. And so, um, we're moving on to Acts now, but we hang on to that thought about praying, believing, because a lot of the time, we don't. We have, we're leaving question marks on our sentences. We're not clear about what God longs for us. We're not even sure what we want ourselves. But the disciples will carry this with them always. So remember, we're going back and forth. The writer of James, you, uh, or maybe, you, I can't remember whether we even talked about this. James, the one who authored this letter, is actually the brother of Jesus. Uh, the author of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, is actually Luke. And so when we re read Luke's Gospel and move into the Acts of the Apostles, there's this uh, kind of sweet continuity that makes a lot of sense there. We're going to be introduced to a couple of other folks here, and so let me remind you that James and John were a sibling pair, brothers of, I mean, uh, brothers to each other, but uh, sons of Zebedee. That's how they're identified most often in the Gospels. Uh, and they're uh, two of the first that Jesus calls to be disciples. Well, they're, they're all, that, that person's going to be mentioned. You need to remember them. And so um, that means they also have connection with Peter, who is off kind of doing his own ministry as well. We've already talked about him going down to encourage the believers. You remember when he healed then Aeneas and he also healed Dorcas? Yeah, well, you're going to meet somebody uh, new here. Peter's going to show up again. Um, but we have uh, Barnabas and Saul, who are good buddies, who are going to be traveling a lot together. And now we hear, we will will hear the name of John Mark. Most often, it, he is named as John, also called Mark, instead of John Mark. We believe he was a cousin to Barnabas. Um, he was a young fella uh, and very excited uh, in his faith. Let's just kind of unplug, I mean, uh, keep on going and, and stay with uh, these uh, portions of Acts. Uh, I want to explain to you kind of what's happened very quickly. And then there are a couple of issues that it points to, I think, for our lives even today. So you've had disciples who were scattered, do you remember, after the stoning of Stephen when he died and uh, they knew that that was going to be encouraged. Then they all scattered. The apostles stayed kind of around Jerusalem. And so many of the other disciples, um, right before Stephen, it was about 120, I mean, 100 plus. There's no telling. I mean, there are thousands now in little pockets everywhere. And they had been going as far out uh, as like Cyprus and Antioch, uh, Phoenicia. And so from... Um, the Holy Land area, kind of uh, out towards uh, Greece, where we know as Greece, but also toward Asia. But they had only been talking to the Jews. And so some others, other disciples, also went in these same areas and began to talk to the Greeks in those areas. Another way of saying the Gentiles. They spoke to the Gentiles there. Um, and they professed faith in Christ. Now the church is growing there too, and Antioch is one of the places where there's great traction with those who are outside of the Jewish faith. But word has gotten back to Jerusalem, don't you know, that um, the expansion of the gospel is now including Gentiles. I thought we worked this out with Peter. Well, not everybody heard that. And so now, uh, word's gotten back to Jerusalem. 
uh, Barnabas is sent to find Saul so that they can go and address the issues uh, in Antioch. Um, but they go, um, they get Barnabas uh, sent to Antioch first, and he is so glad to see what he witnesses there that he encourages them to keep going and to keep sharing the gospel. Uh, Barnabas um, it goes from Antioch to Tarsus to look for Saul uh, and then bring him back to Antioch. Y'all, they spent a year in Antioch together, Barnabas and Saul, teaching the people there, most of them Gentile, uh, discipling them and loving them. There's also in this very same place uh, in the book of Acts, the, an offering is mentioned for the first time, taking up an offering. It's because um, uh, a prophetic word was spoken that a famine was coming. Agabus, I think is the guy's name, he speaks this prophetic word about that, and they don't want the brothers to be um, in even more trouble than they already are. And by brothers, I mean brothers and sisters. They don't want those in the Holy Land, um, in that promised land, um, to be hurting even more than they already are. And so they collect an offering to be able to send to Judea so that they're prepared for whatever happens. And it just so happens that about this time, Herod has arrested a bunch of disciples. His intent is to persecute them. Uh, and he's pretty good at it. James, James and John, you know, I mentioned them. Uh, James has been killed by the sword at Herod's ordering. Uh, and so now they're out for Peter, too. Uh, when he's arrested, um, he is ordered to be guarded, ordered by Herod to be guarded by um, a squad of four soldiers at all times. So there are four squads, four soldiers each squad, rotating. Um, and sometimes all of them, they are together. Uh, it is the night before the trial. Oh, by the way, this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, just like it did with Jesus. And so now Peter's been arrested. Um, he's chained to two of his guards. Uh, two are vigilant uh, outside. And then there are other guards posted further out in the jail. Uh, and so they're sleeping. Peter and his two best friends, not. And in the middle of the night, an angel appears and he basically punches uh, Peter on the shoulder. Quick, get up. And as he's speaking, Peter's chains fall off. He's out the door away from those two guards. They go past the two guards that are outside the cell door. They go past one set of guards further out towards freedom and then yet past another guard. They finally get to the iron gate between the prison and the city and it opens for them. The angel walks with Paul, my, I mean walks with Peter. I'm guessing that they're running. Uh, but they're moving quick, and then all of a sudden, after traveling down one street with him, the angel is gone. Well, Peter keeps on running to Mary's house. Now, let's be clear about which Mary. Mary is actually the mother of John Mark. Hey, the reason why he has two names is because John was a common Jewish name but because they are working with so many folks who are not Jewish, he was often called Mark. Mark is a Greek name, and so with John Mark, even though it sounds like a good Southern name, doesn't it? Um, this is the best of both worlds. And so at Mary's house, John Mark grew up there. It means she probably had a little money since they're referring to her house. But you got a bunch of disciples praying there. Peter uh, goes to the door and knocks. And Rhoda, their servant girl, comes to the door. She's so excited to recognize Peter's face that she forgets to open the door and welcome him in. She runs back to everybody who's praying 
believing. They're praying fervently. And they said, you are out of your mind. See, they're expecting for things to go the way they think they ought to go. There's going to be a trial. Maybe he'll be acquitted. Don't we peg whole how God should fix a lot of things that we bring to God? They were so excited to see when Rhoda went back and opened the door because Peter kept knocking. They were excited to hear about all that had happened. Now he left that place and went to another one because this was going to be rough when Herod discovered that even with all those soldiers that God had done this. I, I'm not so sure that Herod was going to recognize that God had done this. And so that's not the end of the story. I hope that you're reading along. You can check it out. Um, so here's the nosy question. I'm just going out. We're just going to spit it out there. When you pray, do you pray wishing? Do you pray wondering? Do you pray believing? Whether it's for you, for someone else, I, I, I speak to my own struggle. I think sometimes I'm so worried that I will misunderstand what God has in store or I'm already so unclear what God has in store that I don't want to sound foolish. And so I just leave it up to God. But that takes the confidence out of things. I think there's a way for us to pray confidently, confess our lack of knowledge, but also confess our absolute trust in God. And so this praying, believing for one another, whether it's an act of confession that needs to be forgiven so that peace can, be, can rush in when a life is restored to righteousness in Christ, or whether it's the true trouble and suffering of life on this side of glory. Praying, believing, is the kind of long-suffering, patience, consistent resistance, pushing against what would come at us on this side of glory, knowing that there is something better, bigger, more complete, deeper. Oh, promised to us even now. Yes. So I, I hope that you'll spend some time today thinking about what really happens when you pray. What do you mean when you say the words that you do to God? Maybe there's a different way to say them. Or maybe you need to be choosing different words altogether. Maybe we just need to show up and tell God we're not sure what to do with these moments. I'm trusting this, though, that if you will find yourself going to God, God will meet you better than halfway. You'll figure it out. Pray for yourself and pray for others, but pray believing. Lord God, this is such a struggle for us. You've given us the privilege of prayer. You've let us know your name. You have invited us to call on you, with us, which is an exercise of power. You've entrusted to us gifts and ability, and you've also entrusted to us this opportunity, this privilege of prayer. And so often we do it with very little power. We just don't understand. Teach us, God. Show us how it is that we can know your will, how we can know your voice, how we can see the signs of what you're already beginning to do and how we can be bold in claiming what we believe is your activity, the moving of your Holy Spirit on us and in us and through us. Correct us when we make a mistake, but recognize, please, God, that 
Our boldness is out of a desire to serve you in a confident way which you deserve. For you alone are God. We know how much you love us. Well, we have an idea, but we long to experience more of it every day. Thank you, God, for trusting us with all that you do, but especially this gift of prayer. Teach us to be bold and to pray believing for ourselves, for those whom we love, for our communities, for this world, for all that is life now and for eternity. Help us to pray in a way that sets us free and sets us on fire for you. And we will welcome your spirit in the midst of it all. We love you, Lord. Amen. My friends, as we um, have taken in this knowledge about prayer today, we are going to be making some fast tracks uh, through the land as the gospel grows. Can't wait to make that trip with you. I'll see you soon. Bye.